John Hanna, my name is uh, Thomas Gregg, and I'm going to talk to you, to you about my research lab, and in particular some of the topics that um, I wanted to cover, and hopefully are going to be interesting to everyone who's in uh, STEM, uh, including uh, uh, math, the sciences, and engineering, are uh, gas sensors, uh, something about solar and cells, and also a little bit about magnetism and some, some new, new ways that, that we're covering. And really the outline here is, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, um, you know, what my career um, was towards uh, becoming a physicist, and you know, maybe that's uh, useful for you to know, uh, maybe uh, there's many uh, students uh, who want, or there's some students who want to go down this uh, path, and um, maybe there's just some useful information in there. In the, sec sorry, in the second part, I'm going to talk about my research here at Cal State Long Beach and um, talk about some open questions that are unresolved in the entire world and that we want to resolve and they concern gas sensors, so detecting maybe explosives, uh, detecting certain gases. They, uh, um, they're about solar cells uh, converting energy from, from the sun, but, but you could um, you know, think about other energy conversion mechanisms. And to talk about a little bit about magnetism as well, which is um, you know, very important in pretty much uh, all the applications that, that we use. But then I wanted to, to bring um, also something in that you could use and share with, with, with students. And, and um, it, um, so I have uh, three experiments I want to focus on, which is uh, energy absorption. Um, and I have some example of cans um, of different colors and, 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 and how they absorb energy differently. And then conversion or transfer, so, so a solar cell application. and then just to store energy, which is also an important aspect. And I have some uh, solar uh, or some en energy storage devices that you can build yourself um, and uh, that I brought here. And then I, I want to end with some mentioning of programs that we have here locally. I've already mentioned the FISTEC, the Society of Students, and, and, and so forth. All right. So, but um, uh, I was told um, that if you uh, watch a presentation, uh, you can learn about 10% uh, by just reading the slides. And as you guessed, probably, you can learn more if uh, you also listen. <laughs> and you can even uh, learn more if, uh, if you ask questions, <coughs> right? But how can you learn almost everything? Teach. Yes. Uh, it's, it's what you do. Um, what, what you do yourself is to tell this uh, to someone else or, um, you know, uh, tell this story to, to someone else. And at least a portion, maybe, hopefully, um, you will be able to, to tell to someone else. So I want to start, talk, start talking um, about my own career. And I'm um, just, you know, a very typical career. Um, and it, it basically involves, uh, a, you know, a bachelor's degree, a PhD, doing some postdoc, and then becoming a postdoc. And this endeavor takes about a quarter century. In my case, uh, it took about 25 years, and roughly speaking, uh, roughly speaking, about 40 years for a, for a bachelor's, maybe some years for a master's, some years for a PhD, doing some postdoctoral uh, work, and then some assistant professor work, associate professor work, and I'm just just about here after 25 years. And I started off at the University of Basel up here on the Rhine River. Um, math, I studied math right in this building here, uh, looking over the Rhine. And um, uh, Later on, I spent uh, five years at the University of uh, Minnesota. Um, a, um, very beautiful city there, Minneapolis. Um, after me, I, I, I ventured uh, to um, Vietnam. I studied at uh, Hanoi University there. Uh, and then after that, I spent uh, three years at the University of uh, California in San Diego um, before uh, coming here. Which one did you like that? <laughs> They're all great places. <laughs> so, but my first teacher, but my, uh, uh, first teacher was, of course, uh, uh, my, my uh, father. And, uh, you know, as for everyone, uh, uh, my mother and my father were my first uh, teachers. And this is a picture of, of my uh, father here. Here, and um, uh, this is my father, and uh, so I'm um, here. The profession would be called cowboy, right? Um, and so I was grown up with uh, cows and learned about how to take care of cows, and um, and then I learned how to uh, grow uh, potatoes and uh, grow wheat and corn and uh, all the other good stuff. And 
Uh, I was involved in uh, picking fruits and cherries and apples and pears and all that. Um, and so um, it's, it's needless to say that every student, um, you know, in, 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 in on the roadmap, um, they come from different trajectories, and uh, there's many uh, surprises, and um, uh, that they're along this way, and. I find that it's, it's very usual, it's very general case, even though the specific surprises are surprises. But uh, they're very general, everyone has surprises. So I, I listed some, um, some of mine, I guess. So um, I did three study abroad programs uh, to, to learn uh, three languages. Um, I got a degree in classics, uh, I studied Latin for eight years and Greek for four years, um, and I was um, uh, I wanted to go to medical school, and I was almost um, they, um, going to start, but I, I got to know some physicists, and um, um, we, we became friends, and then I said, okay, I'm going to study physics instead. Um, during my uh, uh, undergraduate career, I also uh, worked part-time like many. I, I was a database a developer at the pharmaceutical company, and then um, for... While I, I was getting my PhD, of course, I was a teaching assistant as well. And after my PhD, I went to um, another country as well. I went to Vietnam for a while. Also worked three years uh, for a private company, a startup doing electronic medical uh, records, uh, again in database. Um, and then I should mention, you know, I received two postdoc offers, and um, one uh, was very highly paid, and one was very uh, was 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 paid much less, and I uh, took the one that was paid much less, um, and and so 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 uh, there's many surprises. Um, I became professor. I uh, organized uh, workshops, for example, one in Cali, Colombia, in South America, and I also. Um, uh, helped uh, create a new program here, which is a material research uh, program, and it's kind of a liaison between chemical engineering, chemistry, and physics, and puts all, all the best uh, of that in, in there. So these, these are some of the surprises. But I did one more thing. I took one year to do one more thing. So. Um, and I think, you know, a passion is, 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 is very important. And it's, it's really um, um, the passion that you can give someone um, that, that, that's going to be important in life. And it doesn't really matter what passion, but it's an inquisitive uh, nature, uh, a nature to ask questions, to always, uh, uh, always be attentive to, to, to details. And I spent one year, one entire year, uh, traveling the world uh, with my wife um, at the time. I went to uh, South America, I went to uh, Russia, I went to Siberia in January. Um, I, that was, that was, that was, that was, I went to Mount Everest. Um, I went to uh, Namibia, or Chitotongwe, in in in, in, Af in in the southern part of Africa. Uh, went to the rice fields in in, in Vietnam, and um, always asked asked lots of questions. Um, this is uh, uh, the border. This is in Vietnam. This is in in, in China here. And the, the, um, there's uh, lots of people there. And I was very surprised when I arrived, and and, and they haven't seen uh, anyone getting there for, you know, 15, 20 years, and, um, and they, um, there was so much tradition and, and culture and ideas that they had, and nobody knew about uh, many of the lives of, of, of the people who lived there, um, and there's uh, very little documentation, and uh, um, um, so it was very interesting for me to, 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 to do this, uh, and um, I, I felt like the year uh, was, was, was good. So, um, so there's a tra there's a traditional roadmap here on the left, but the, the right side, you know, um, is is very individual, and, and it it sort of um, uh, conveys the idea that you know anyone can um, uh, basically attain or achieve those goals that they that they uh, set forward or that they're passionate about. Um, of course, um, I, I should add, um, I didn't say that. Um, so when I was growing up, my, my parents um, uh, you know, and, and teachers, they thought, well, maybe um, he's going to become a farmer. And I said, I wasn't so interested in farming. They said, they said well, maybe carpenter. Um, and um, uh, my, my family lived in a very remote, and, and my parents never ventured more than a few uh, miles the next village, which was about you know, 200 people. And so um, I said, carpenter, I was not interested. And one day I came home and I said, I want, I want to, I really like school, and I just want to uh, be a student. And then after I'm finished with being a, a, a student or pupil, I'm going to retire. 
and this uh, horrified my parents uh, very much. So, but I think I achieved that goal, and uh, I'm, I'm, I, every day I can still uh, uh, continue and learn uh, and, and be, be that student, and hopefully um, one day I'm um, uh, retired. So this is my group here um, at uh, Cal State Long Beach. Um, it's made up of uh, students. Uh, graduate students and undergraduate students um, who work and do research here in the lab and um, they um, uh, maybe some of them uh, you mentored or, or you know them and um, uh, they all have ambitions and, and, and goals right and we, we like to fulfill them one of the projects that I have is based on gas sensors and uh, so gas sensors you're familiar with they uh, measure uh, monitor gas leakage or the emissions uh, from industry, um, the monitor, or they can uh, detect explosive, explosives or uh, warfare agents. And some of the questions that people have today, um, some of the open questions, you know, um, are how can we distinguish, for example, different agents, different molecules, not just detect them, but how can we tell one is different than, than the other? And um, what materials can we use or are suitable to, to make this uh, gas sensors? What, what are the um, most suitable? And, you know, one of the most common gas sensors probably used in the airport. Um, uh, this one is, is based on uh, a spectroscopy ion mass, mass ion spectrometer. And um, when you go to the airport and someone wipes uh, the suitcase and there's maybe a small trace amount of, of whatever uh, dust uh, came into contact, then um, this will identify the material and so it could be checked against uh, an explosive database. Um, for example, um, so another uh, option is uh, uh, to use uh, uh, um, you know uh, dogs. Uh, also, certainly happens. Um, and um, our alternative is to um, create uh, very inexpensive uh, small uh, chips based on nanotechnology. So things that are um, on the order of one billionth of a meter, and, and they're very cheap because they use very little material and they use very little uh, uh, power. And the particular material that I'm interested in is a small molecule. And the molecule looks like this, and it's like a plate that you put in a dishwasher. It's uh, planar, and so I uh, drew it from, from different perspectives. And um, it, there's uh, some nitrogen here in blue. There's some, some uh, carbon in gray and, and, and hydrogen at the outside. But the most important thing in the middle is there's a metal in, in the middle. And the idea for the gas sensors then was um, maybe we can change this metal ion in the middle and we can, um, you know, be sensitive to different kinds of materials. Um, and so we created uh, this uh, type of gas sensor here. Um, it, it just has a, um, two <coughs> interdigitated gold um, electrodes. So interdigitated means um, it's like your fingers and they're uh, interdigitated. They almost, um, they don't touch anywhere, um, but they, they create, create this kind of Sorry. Learning the, uh, uh, the, the they're inter 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 there's one finger this way and then the other finger this way and this amplifies uh, the current very much so. And then we deposit the material and the material has this blue color, this uh, uh, material called thalassine on top of it. And um, and then we measure just um, the electrical current and the current. Um, then depends on uh, what's being absorbed on the surface of this material. And remember, we can change this metal ion that's in the center uh, without changing um, the morphology. And so that um, allows us then to tune to a specific um, uh, material. And so um, if you zoom in, uh, the molecules would, would, would lie on top of, of this material like, like, like this. So this is an organic uh, transistor. And so if, if we want to look at the surface, we use something called atomic force microscopy. Yes, a question. You said, are you calling it organic because of the gas molecules that rest on it and change the, uh, the current? Yeah, we call it organic because it has lots of carbon here, oh, okay. these, these okay. carbon okay. rings. Right, right, right. Yes, exactly. So it's a very good question. Are those question. gold nanowires? Yeah, th these are not nanowires. They are interdigitated electrodes. Um, nanowires would be even smaller than this. So um, if, if I didn't put a scale here, except here is 200 nanometers. So this is um, about uh, 50 micrometers, so the size of a hair. So it's not yet a nano wire. But um, gold nano wire is very important for a lot of medical applications. And um, yeah, it, we, we, could, we could make devices with, with, with gold nano 
Why is that? Yes, no, no, just What do you expect to see when you change the metal ion to something else? Is that a different kind of absorption? Yeah, yes. Uh, I would ex we, we, we find, uh, we found, because we already did, did this, we found that they absorb differently to different <coughs> metal, uh, metal ions. And so we can run many sensors in, in parallel. And so, um, for example, we can say, oh, this one turns on, this one a little bit, and this one not at all. And then um, that gives us one combination that we can then train to a particular. Um, so it's, it's, it's much better than if we have one and just absorbs a little bit. We don't know um, it, it absorbs something, but not one. Yeah. So this, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. <clears throat> this seems to me like an electronic version, almost of a gas chromatography machine. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's very simple. Um, it, it doesn't do, it's, it's not as complex. This okay. is much, much simpler. So basically, it's just saying, and, and if, if you were to do this in your school, you, you said you wanted to do it without these, you could just take two gold blobs or, or use, you know, kind of, uh, uh, say, indium or silver paint, um, paint something here, paint something here, and then put the organic molecule in the middle. You can also spray paint that, and then just measure the resistance. And I will show you on the next slide that the resistance changes. Yes? Would this be useful to detect radioactive materials? Okay, would it be useful to detect radioactive materials? In this case, um, we, we measure the impedance or resistance change. So it's purely, um, so, so this absorbs something and that changes how the electrons flow through uh, this device. And uh, that's, now radioactivity would interact in a different way with the material. And so we would need a, a different uh, kind of detector. Usually, you know, um, we would use, yeah, we would use different. Okay, well, that, that's great. Um, all the questions. So, there's one more, one other thing that we can also change. We can change the material, the, the metal ion, but we can also change the structure. And so, to look at the structure, we need quite um, an amplification. We need to go and look down at the one nanometer uh, resolution. So, that means if you have one meter, we need to go one billion times down. I just want to uh, show you what, what that means. So, this is the Earth um, from 50,000. Uh, kilometers. Uh, if you zoom in a hundred times, you will see the LA basin. Um, if you zoom in ten thousand times, um, you see um, Cal State Long Beach, which is here, and here's the pyramid. And so, if you zoom in a hundred thousand times, you see uh, the pyramid structure. Um, you may have seen um, here, and we uh, we we can't zoom in more because the optical uh, doesn't zoom. We have to zoom in even more um, to to resolve about one meter. Uh, something of, of, of this length uh, from, from, from outer space. So um, uh, this device is called Atomic Force micro Microscope and it works because with light, with a microscope, an optical microscope, you cannot get achieve this resolution. It works by uh, using a finger, a very small finger, rastering the surface and um, um, detecting a signal. And so this is the surface signal and it shows that we can make samples that have a very a structure which is very small and very small features. We can make big structures and we can make uh, uh, even very huge structures. And you would expect that the absorption would, would happen in different ways as, as well. So we have another tool yet to di distinguish. And so we should be able to distinguish a myriad of, um, of uh, uh, things. So here's a, a, a current, and so we, we, we just introduced some methanol, and you can see the current will change as a function of uh, this introduction of the methanol. You, um, you stop the methanol, it goes back, and so forth. And so this is a film, for example, with small grains. We, we, we do one with long grains, and we see some uh, quantitative uh, difference in the response. And so that we have, using just one material, even changing the grain size, we have a sensitivity to this. So um, we, we use some other um, um, things such as ethanol, toluene, um, uh, you know, a nerf uh, gas agent, uh, nitrobenzene, kind of explosive, uh, all sorts of different things. And um, uh, we created an optimal device uh, which, which we, we, we then uh, also even patented um, in, in this ultra thin organic thin film transistor chemical uh, uh, sensor uh, patent. So, so, so this is um, the, um, a way um, to make 
gas sensors. And of course, the story hasn't ended yet. You, you, um, there's so many different things that you can now put together. And so this uh, is where engineers come in and, and they'll figure out uh, the best way of, of um, putting uh, sensors with big grains and small grains and of different uh, metal ions into the game. All right. So um, the second project that um, uh, I have for students uh, is on uh, solar cells. And you know that uh, the most common solar cells are silicon solar cells. And um, they have a high cost because they require purified silicon, which basically is just sand on the beach uh, or glass. But um, it needs to be very pure. And uh, to achieve that, you have to heat it to a very high temperature. So a lot of energy is required to uh, create uh, these uh, solar cells. And so the price uh, entails in the energy cost. An alternative is to use organic materials, which are low temperature, room temperature, processed in mold. And um, to use uh, thinner films, so that's called the second generation, is to use less material. It's just to make the film very uh, thin and to use uh, much less material. And the third generation of solar cells, which uh, we're tr um, uh, interested in <coughs> developing, is to use new materials so that we can make solar cells which are maybe flexible. Um, we can make solar cells um, which are semi-transparent, so you could put them on, on a window and maybe absorb in the infrared uh, regime. Um, new materials that, that can be straight, um, spray painted or coated um, in different ways and that maybe are not as efficient but can be produced, mass produced in roll to roll uh, processes onto large um, surfaces and can be used for example in, in, in large power plants where size uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, make an effect. We use um, this same very molecule because we specialize in this uh, thalassiming molecule and we use the one that has zinc in it and we created the device uh, using glass, um, ITO, which is a transparent conductor. Um, it's another research impetus that, that's uh, uh, very extensive. Um, people are trying to look for conductors, which are also transparent. Most of the conductors are um, uh, shiny, like uh, gold or silver or copper. Um, so the light can penetrate this uh, conducting layer and hit the active thalassiming layer, uh, which is used uh, in conjunction with uh, C60, uh, which is the uh, uh, fullerene molecule, to uh, separate um, a hole and an electron so that uh, the charge carriers uh, can be uh, you know, separated. We essentially have a positive and a negative uh, voltage that uh, is, is generated here at the aluminum uh, end, and um, the other way at the silver end on, on this side through this pathway here. Pathway. All right. Um, so here's a, a device that uh, one of my students uh, uh, made. It's, uh, it's one of the finished uh, solar cells uh, here. And, and um, here's the transparent ITO. Here's um, the silver bus bar. And this is the thalassiding, which is this bluish color. And we put the aluminum dots on top there. So these are six devices that we can uh, study and um, um, use light to illuminate. And we find uh, that, too, if we measure the power of these, the power output, the maximum power that these solar cells can produce, there is also dependence on this grain size. So that's, uh, the, that's shown here as deposition uh, temperature. So these are, are small grains over here. The grains become bigger and bigger. And at a particular size, grain size, um, the solar cell or the material is um, producing the most amount of power. So this was um, the outcome of, 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 of the study on solar cells. We're also interested in the magnetic properties of, of these materials. And so, you know, magnetism is very important in everyday's life. Um, you need it to do um, Tetris on, on the refrigerator <laughs> and uh, to stick notes there so you don't forget things. Um, uh, to listen to music, your earphones, they all have magnets. For motors, hard disks to, to, to store uh, data. Uh, for transportation and, of course, um, to store your credit card information. Uh, to be read out. Um, I should not forget um, uh, your horse uh, would be barefoot uh, without uh, uh, the iron uh, down there. So, what are some of the challenges or open questions people have about magnets? <coughs> um, one is uh, people would like to have a stronger magnets, um, where, where strong means the work or the, the amount of work uh, that they can get out, out of it. People would like to have lighter magnets because they're in motors and so, you know, um, that, uh, that, that, you know, that drone or, or whatever has a motor in it, it's very heavy. 
because <coughs> the motor ha has a, a magnet in it, and that magnet, uh, you know, makes uh, um, means that you have to put more energy into it um, to make it lift. You would like to have magnets which are transparent. Why not, right? Um, you would like to have optically active magnets, and maybe you'd like to have uh, magnets that don't break when you uh, flex it. Um, um, and that could give you uh, all sorts of new, new applications. So just to give you um, a timeline, so um, here's the year 1910, and here's the year uh, 2020, and here's the amount of work that a magnet could do. So you, know, you have your basic steel magnets, which contain some iron, maybe some nickel or cobalt, and um, it, it produced some work, it was uh, okay, but people have then uh, produced new materials, you know, they put in aluminum and nickel and cobalt, for example, and they could, you know, almost uh, double the amount of work that you could get out of a magnet. Um, in the 1970s, the um, um, new Samarian cobalt magnets came out, and, you know, about 20 years ago, we had the neodymium iron bar magnets, which, which are here, and um, they have been, uh, uh, become a, a very uh, powerful. Yes? I'm trying to figure, how do you measure the work out of a magnet? Yes, the work you measure by measuring the magnetization. So, so a magnet uh, uh, has a magnetization, and then you apply the magnetic field, and against what? Uh, then you apply an external magnetic field. So you you know the Earth has a magnetic field. So you apply an additional magnetic field um, using, uh, for example, a, a wire where you drive a current through it that produces a magnetic field, and you further ma increase the magnetization of that. And then you decrease it, and there's a hysteresis, and the area that would be the work um, that the magnet uh, can do. So it's the magnetization times the applied uh, magnetic field. Yes, I, I may have a graph of, of that uh, later on as well. But um, so, so these are the best magnets, and they're everywhere. And every windmill uses this. Every motor, a car has about 50 motors, electro motors. Um, it's 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 everywhere. And as you know, uh, China produces about 98% of neodymium. And so um, a couple of years ago, uh, they, uh, they were upset with uh, Japan. So they said, we're not going to give you any neodymium. And we, we may not give you neodymium anymore. And so um, um, the U.S. got also a little scared. And so they put in lots of programs of uh, substitutes for neodymium. And they're starting to open up the mines. Uh, there's a couple in Alaska and in California that were closed uh, because they're, um, uh, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to extract rare earths. Um, so, um, so, so we have made a, a lot of technological pro um, abilities, you know, that your headphones produce such good sound in such a small area. It's, it's due to um, um, uh, these magnets. And so this small magnet here, um, creates the same work as a big steel magnet. So if, if you were living in 1940s um, with your walk band, you would, you would have a magnet this big. And, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible otherwise. So um, um, our, our um, ideas to uh, progress on this is um, to go to lower dimensions. Um, hard disks there has been a, a revolution with going to uh, two dimensions. And so how can you go to lower dimensions? And so this is a rice terrace here, farm here, and the rice terrace. And you can see that um, there's water here, and there's dirt here, water, dirt, water, dirt. And so this would be kind of a one-dimensional line. And so um, this is a stepped a terraced surface. And um, a, a cobalt or iron is being um, um, deposited from the side. Um, and uh, it creates these lines. And so um, we're uh, producing uh, something similar where we use our molecule, instead of using these complicated terraced uh, surfaces, we use the carbon of our molecule um, to space the lines. And um, we use a vacuum deposition to do that, so we um, uh, empty out all the air. We put the material, our organic, metal-organic thalassine material down here. We heat it up to about 300 degrees Celsius. Um, at which um, it, the molecules sublime and they hit the surface and we make uh, thin film samples which look like, like this. They're very thin coverage, um, just a few uh, tens of nanometers, so they're about a thousand times thinner than a hair. And um, they have very peculiar magnetic properties. And here we measure, for example, the magnetization as a function of time. And we found that our new materials um, 
are tunable in a way that traditional materials, such as these alloys that I showed you previously, are not. Um, and so um, this is a, you know, still ongoing work, of course, and um, we hope to uh, deliver those transparent, flexible magnets in, in, in the near future. So I think the uh, general approach, and you know, something that you do in the classroom too, is, is to prepare samples, to model, do the experiment, do the prediction, and then refine the model. So I wanted to do an example here in the uh, time, I think that um, I'm allotted. And I wanted to show you how you can build some samples, uh, and I want to uh, show in particular how to build some capacitor, how to store energy um, using aluminum foil. I wanted to um, alert you to, to some simulations in all fields, biology, engineering, physics, chemistry. Um, who knows about FET, by the way? Yeah, yeah. Almost everyone. So, um, and, um, also wanted to let you know about the Arduino microcontroller. Who knows about the um, Arduino microcontrollers? A little bit. Um, which can be used to, to um, physically accumulate data very inexpensive and very nicely. And then um, you, can, you can use a, you know, R or, or some, some, some version of uh, making the graphs. And refine your models and go back. So um, I want to show you uh, some examples, as I mentioned, some very simple examples. The first is, is absorption of energy with different surfaces. And um, so what, what, we would, what we would do is we would ask um, everyone to bring you know, some can or something um, and, um, of a different color. And um, one of the experiments that you can do is um, you can take, um, and I have, I have two cans here, a black can and um, a silver can. They're actually identical, but uh, we spray painted them. And if you, um, if you put them on the surface, and you use um, a heater, and this is just a, a, a lamp, um, then uh, you can use um, a thermometer and you can ask yourself, uh, this is a thermometer here, um, which, which, um, which measures the temperature, right? And it indicates here, they're about uh, $70 or so. And so you can measure then the temperature um, of these cans and you can ask yourself, which, which can would get hotter first or would heat up? Uh, faster would absorb more, right? Or, or, or do they absorb the heat in the same way? You can also ask which kind of light bulb um, emits heat in a way that it can be absorbed. Are, are they different? Are there differences? Um, you can also ask um, the question, which one cools off faster? And so um, sometimes you're given the chance uh, if, if, let's say you don't have a car, and you ask a friend, and you have two friends, one has a black car, one has a white car, the car's been staying out in the sun all day, and um, you, you have a choice, you know, who should you ask first uh, for a ride home, right? And both of them said their air conditioning is not working. Right? So you have to um, kind of uh, make uh, decisions, uh, and, 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 and you, can, you can do the experiment. And so what, um, so, so you can do this uh, very simply just using a thermometer, and you can use uh, you know, all kinds of variations. You can fill them with water and, 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 and use a, a different kind of heat sources and, and so forth. Um, but you can also use um, something called an Arduino. Um, an Arduino is, is, is this, this board here. It's available for uh, about $20, uh, even in the US, $15 or so. And it can do all sorts of things. It can basically um, get... Um, uh, get your temperature to the computer, and so you can do very accurate uh, scientific measurements. And, and you, so I use a thermometer, and I, I just uh, tape the thermometer on the, onto the can. The thermometer is about a dollar, dollar fifty or seventy cents if you uh, uh, buy, you know, penny. Um, so which 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 car is going to cool cool down faster, the black car or the white car? Which one? Which ride should you take? The white car is going to cool down faster. Um, it turn, turn, turns out the black one, the black cools down faster. It also absorbs faster, but it will also emit faster the energy. So the black car, so if, if they're both at the same at temperature, and so, so I did this with the can with the Arduino, it, it, it takes some time, and so I don't have enough time, maybe in, in the intermission. But so um, I turned on the lamp, they both heated up, they haven't fully reached their, their limit yet. Um, but the black can heated faster than the silver. But then um, the black can also um, decreased faster. It emits energy much faster so that the black car can cool off uh, much more quickly. Another um, experiment I recommend you to do is 
uh, experiments with solar cells, and there's just many uh, different ways uh, to do this, but they're um, pretty inexpensive, and, and, and you can uh, uh, purchase them, and, and so all you need is, is you know, one of these uh, panels, and then um, uh, an amp meter, and the resistor. The resistor um, is the load of your circuit, so you, this is the load, and then you measure the current here, and you have a solar cell. And you can ask yourself, I'm going to turn this on and, and, and the people on this table are going to uh, tell you that this uh, actually works. <laughs> this actually works. And, uh, and so um, uh, you, you can see that um, we can see an increase in the, in the current. So I, I even have to go one point scale up. You can see an increase if I put it under light here. So you can ask your question, what, what happens if I um, cover half, half of my solar cell? What happens if I change the color, um, the color of the light source? So um, you can buy these these things here. Um, they they produce different colors, uh, for example. So so what happens if I use a, a red light uh, versus a blue light? Right? What happens to, to to to? You can ask what happens if I change the angle. You can have you can ask yourself what happens if I change the, the temperature? What if I run it in Minnesota or if I run it in Arizona? I have the same same sound input. You can you, you can ask yourself lots of questions, right? So um, you can do that. But now you have the energy, you produce the energy, um, you want to store it. Energy storage is big, you know, like with the solar and wind in particular, you want to store that energy. Um, and so um, Usually, uh, one way to store energy is inside the capacitor. Uh, this is a capacitor. And um, to measure, um, yeah, so inside the capacitor. And so I have, um, and, and so what is a capacitor? Um, let, me, let me show you how to build a capacitor, how to store energy. Well, you need two things. You need, yes. Um, you need two things. You need uh, um, a conductor, aluminum, and uh, um, uh, something that's not conducting. So I use aluminum foil, put this in a plate, put another plate in top, another aluminum foil, and now I have two plates which are close together. And one can store, store energy on this side, and one can store energy on the other side. And so you say, well, how much, how much does this have? Right? And, and different students are going to bring different techniques. And so I have another one here. It's, this one is made with... Um, 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 Mylar uh, saran wrap. So there's a saran wrap uh, between the two foils, and so saran wrap is a very thin, and so I can make a high capacitor uh, this way. Um, so how can you measure? And so I, I bet you, you can use again the Arduino board to quantify this, and um, I can show you in the intermission um, how this works. Um, uh, but I, I think, yeah. So, um, so, so, so this is the Arduino board, um, and I connect the uh, capacitor and the resistor here, and when you um, measure it, uh, I didn't include it here, when you measure it, you can uh, then get um, a curve that looks like this, from which you can determine the capacity of, of, of that capacitor. So, of course, it's, uh, it's very interesting for students who can make uh, the best capacitor, and how can you make a capacitor better. So, um, I have one, one final question, I have, I have just a general capacitor here, and the uh, audience here in this table, they can read and say, what is the capacitance uh, right now? This, the units are picofarads. 62.4. Okay, so right now there's nothing between the capacitor, but I have a piece of glass here. If I put that piece of glass in, inside the capacitor, can I put, will the capacitance of this device increase or will it decrease or will it stay the same? Glass doesn't do anything. What do you think? Who, who thinks it's going to increase? Who thinks it's going to stay the same? And who thinks it's going to decrease? No <laughs> All right, but um, you have to you have to uh, uh, get, get your uh, idea in, right? We learned that because if you don't have an idea right now, or or a notion or conception, then um, uh, you, there's nothing that that um, will stay. So what will happen? It goes up. So we can we can increase the capacitance. The capacitor is now bigger. So that's how we can make. We can of course stick all sorts of things in here. We can put paper in here, napkins. Um, you know, you you uh, you you figure it out. So um, um, this is how you can make a bigger capacitor, right? And we want to store more. We want to store more in the same space. I didn't change the space. So we want to store more. So what can we put in, in there? So those, those are the questions that uh, we ask ourselves. 
All right, so uh, most of you know the effect, and so you, you can simulate that over there. I wanted to point out, if you need these ideas, how to do this in the classroom, I, um, I urge you to go to the American Association of Physics Teachers, and they have this, some, something similar for biology and chemistry engineering. But um, uh, they have an American Journal of Physics. They have excellent uh, articles. You may even write an article for the American uh, uh, Journal of Physics. Um, so you may conduct something like this in your class and find out what, it, what are the best materials and, uh, and then uh, publish this. There's also a resource library uh, over there. Um, what do we do here um, to uh, fill this up? So we have a high school teacher in residence. So we have someone who is always uh, coming here. We um, offer Physics 390, Exploring Physics Teaching. So we like to send our students to your classes um, to see how it's actually done and to see which students um, have a passion for, for the kind of work, um, for, for teaching work. We also have the FizTech program, which is to um, have more teachers uh, uh, um, have a diverse uh, teaching population for the, for the future. So and they have demo days and where, where, where teachers uh, come here on campus. They have, there's a newsletter, uh, there's a website. If you have questions, uh, you can ask for them. Um, so this was the egg drop. It's always fun. So this is the uh, teachers uh, who, who came here. Um, this is the, the how, how, they, how, how, you, how, you look, how everyone looks like. Um, we also have the Society of Physics students. So these are the students. Uh, coming to our campus, and um, um, you know they like to come and visit high schools and show uh, show them do demonstrations just like I did. Um, that's it. So um, you can contact me at this email address. Uh, I told you about the career of a business, typical with surprises. I showed you that my research interest over the last 20 years or so has been on the molecule thalassemia, which has many applications. We worked on gas sensors, solar cells, magnetism. There's, there's other areas, uh, too, that other people uh, work on, but those are my uh, areas. Um, you already knew about the FET simulations, but the Arduino microcontroller is a very inexpensive device where you can quantify the experiments that you do. And the students love it because um, you can do a little bit of pro uh, you can uh, um, um, do all sorts of things, and I'm happy to, to show you a particular uh, aspect of this afterwards. We have outreach programs, and with that, um, I, I think I should uh, finish here. <laughs>